we begin here. And uh, Brother Achungpu, if you can lead us in prayer, then we'll turn it over to, uh, to Dr. Mark Ward, and he will start us into talking about original language interpretation. Okay, let's pray. God, we thank you for the unique opportunity that they have given to us. We thank you for the desire and the willingness of our brother Mark as he come forward and uh, lectured us. Pray the Lord you give us the wisdom and knowledge from above so that Lord his lecturing may be beneficial for each one of us that who attend and listen to the lecture. May this time be a blessing for all of us to enjoy your word and that Lord that may be a blessing to share to the people that whom we know and Lord your name be glorified. We commit our class, our time into your mighty care. In Jesus precious name we ask and pray. Amen. 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 Doctor, thank you very much. Thank you for your prayer. Dr. Amen. Ward. All right. Good morning or afternoon or evening, whatever it is for you. And I'm going to start today by letting you talk. So I want to ask you a question and let's all get our chat windows up so that you can answer because I'm going to sit here until I get answers. And I'm not going to give you any lecture until you give me some answers. Here's the question. What is the advantage of knowing and using Greek and Hebrew in preparation for Bible teaching. Give me at least one or two specific ideas in the chat. I've got 10 points to give for our first lecture this morning, and I'll give them to you if you give me 10 points or more. So go. What is the advantage of knowing and using Greek and Hebrew in preparation for Bible teaching? What do you think? Confidence of knowing what God's word is saying. Good. Focuses your attention on the text, forces you to scrutinize the details. That's good. When we're not sure of the meaning, it conveys the original concept. <clears throat> it helps to understand the original points of view, gives us the real meaning of the text as the author may have meant it. More accurate rendering of the passage. Getting the more precise nuances in the expressions, especially in Greek. Original intended meaning. There isn't a one-to-word -word correspondence to another language, that's true. Understanding reason for differences in different translations, that's good. More precise nuances where Greek is Phrased in detail, helps you or exegetical study as you study the grammar and construction, helps to see the cultural background. Good, all good. Allows us to know the original meaning of God's word to his people. Okay. Helps us see beyond our assumed reading of the text and see it in a fresh way. Very true. Good job, Dr. Arnold. Ten points for you. Let's get a couple more here. even if you haven't studied Greek or Hebrew, shows a love for God's word. Good, it's kind of my final point. Let's get two more. Gives us to know the literary style of the scriptures. Okay, good. And helps you to know what questions to ask in the passage. That is fantastic. Okay, we've got another one. Gives an added dimension in your study of God's word. Good to see you, Ping. Forces us to focus and think. Yeah, that's great. That's definitely true. Makes you slow down. That's good. Boy, I could add to my own lecture. This is great. It helps us to avoid preconceived interpretation. 
Good. Helps you understand the author's intention, hunger for the word. Good. Okay. You have earned a lecture. That is great. These are great comments. Um, I'm going to scan them one more time. Okay. I'm going to save one for uh, further, further talk. <clears throat> okay. I've got 10, and we're going to jump right in, and I'm going to try to weave in some of your responses as I go on. <clears throat> and Dr. Arnold is right. The learning the original languages affirms our strong commitment to God's words at the foundation of our beliefs. Um, so there are more than 10 reasons. These do not exhaust the reasons. If you've read the article that I sent you by Jason DeRoshi, you've read some good reasons. There are plenty of Greek teachers out there, especially on the internet and Hebrew teachers who've given their own lists. Here's mine. Number one, we use the original languages. We study them because they increase interpretive accuracy. And that's what a number of you said. And I'm going to borrow directly here from David Martin Lloyd-Jones, famous British preacher, who said that, who asked the question in his famous book, Preaching and Preachers, which is a series of lectures at Westminster Seminary back in the late 60s or early 70s, he said, what is the place of a knowledge of the original languages? He says, they are of great value for the sake of accuracy. No more, that is all. That's what Lloyd-Jones says. They cannot guarantee accuracy, but they promote it. That is definitely true. He says, this is a part of the mechanics of preaching, not the big thing, not the vital thing, but it is important. The preacher should be accurate. He should never say things that some learned member of his congregation can show to be wrong and based on a misinterpretation. Knowledge of the original languages is important in that way. He says, but let us never forget that the ultimate object of this man's training is to enable him to preach, to convey the Bible message to the people, the vast majority of whom will not be experts on languages or on philosophy. His business is to convey the message to them, to be understanded of the people. The object of the training is not to make the student a great expert in linguistics, so much as to make him an accurate man. And I start with a quotation from Lloyd-Jones that has some uh, significant caveats in there. He's not completely rah-rah about the original languages. He limits their value to some uh, standards of evaluation. Namely, he says that the vast majority of your hearers aren't going to be experts in language and your, the object of your training is, is not to become a great expert in linguistics. Um, and I think there's truth in there, and we don't want to go too far. Well, I start with a point that tells us that, yes, interpretive accuracy is increased, but you can, you can go too far with it. Um, and we'll, we'll catch that theme as we go on through other points. However, I think I'm a bit more rah-rah than David Martin Lloyd-Jones. Uh, Lloyd-Jones did not have all of the um, educational benefits in, his, in God's providence, that he might have wished to have had. Um, you are getting a benefit that he didn't have by being able to take a course like this one. And I think I can make a good case to, uh, to not have to give even so many caveats. Um, because yes, it's true, not everybody in your congregation will have this learning. And in fact, uh, very likely very few people will. <clears throat> but um, no one can rise um, no one is likely to rise above your level when you preach and teach the Bible. And if you, by God's grace, through his good providence, can raise that level to uh, a good height, to the height of your gifting and opportunities, um, you don't know where the Lord will take you. There is a verse in Proverbs that says, do you see a man diligent in his business? He will not stand before average men. He'll stand before kings you may have the opportunity and responsibility to use your Bible teaching in some elite areas of the culture. Um, if you have the opportunity to learn the original languages, do it, do it, do it. Number two, uh, learn the original languages because they make contextual connections which are necessarily obscured by translation. So in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the true vine, my father is the husbandman, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And here I'm reading from the King James. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. 
Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. Now, um, one of these sentences in John 15 uh, from Jesus, doesn't it first seem to flow very well with what comes before and after it? And you have to read carefully to really even notice that. Um, and somebody said in the comments that slowing down, um, being forced to focus is a huge value of the original languages. And that is definitely, definitely true. But even in English, I kind of stumbled over the contextual connection here. I am the true vine, my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Then he says, now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Why does he break out of his vine and fruit talk to mention, now ye are clean? Now, he gets right back to the original topic of the paragraph after that sentence. Um, this, is, this is a good example of the kind of thing that knowing Greek can do for you. The word translated clean and the word translated purgeth in the previous sentence are from the same Greek root. There's a contextual connection here that is perhaps necessarily obscured in English. Um, translators don't always have the option of showing off the the similarity between roots, um, uh, Greek roots or Hebrew roots. And if you can read Greek, and if you make sure to check it while you're going through, you're gonna catch this contextual connection. Or consider Ephesians and its very long sentences. English, at least, just doesn't support such long sentences. They feel so incredibly unnatural that most translations, uh, English translations, of course, break up Paul's long sentences. But there's a series of subordinations that uh, in those sentences that are important to know if you are concerned about careful accuracy. So the first reason to learn original languages is because they increase interpretive accuracy. And the second reason is kind of a, a specification of that. They make contextual connections, which are sometimes necessarily obscured by translation. Moving right on, number three because the original languages rule out some interpretations. Now I'm gonna pick something that is maybe a little bit silly. Um, and if you're not familiar with the King James Version, this may not strike a chord with you, but I wonder how many of you have used Bible translations which use a particular convention, that is italicizing words that are supplied by the translators. So, this example is Psalm 14.1. In the King James, it says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. And the words, there is, are italicized, meaning that they were supplied by the translators. A footnote here, the King James translators were not perfectly consistent in their use of italics. Um, they, uh, in my research, didn't even bother with italics more than about four times, I think it was in the Apocrypha. Um, and the, the italics drop off um, after a certain chapter in Acts, as I recall. I've been reading David Norton's work on this. Um, but they made a valiant effort to include italics all throughout pretty much the rest of the scripture. And if those words, there is, are supplied by the translators, then some people reading Psalm 14 come up with a clever way to interpret it. They say, what this really means is, the fool says in his heart, no God. In other words, the fool is making a direct address to God and telling him, no, that's what a fool is. I've heard numerous people over the years use this, preachers who uh, wanna come up with something clever and uh, in seminary, I discovered while learning Hebrew that there's one very significant problem with this argument, at least one. The Hebrew word translated no um, doesn't mean no as in the word that two-year-olds love to say to their mothers when their mothers tell them to do something. That word no means non-existence of. So the King James translation is fine in this case, except they didn't need to put the italics there. 
the words there is are demanded by the structure of English. So they belong there. They just, they don't have to be written out in Hebrew, but they do in English. The King James is being overmuch honest, as Ecclesiastes says in the King James, uh, in a way that can mislead those who don't know Hebrew. If you drop the italicized words in Psalm 14.1, you won't be reading what David wrote. You'll be unwittingly twisting it. David wrote that the fool is guilty of atheism. There is no God, not of defiance. No God. Original languages help you see at that level of detail um, what the text is really saying. Number four, because but learning the original languages enables you to follow commentaries. I'm going to be quoting multiple times today from Moises Silva, who is a Bob Jones University graduate just like me, went on to study under a major uh, linguist named James Barr, who wrote a book called The Semantics of Biblical Language. And Silva, in his book, God, Language, and Scripture, which is collected into a book called Foundations of Contemporary Interpretation, um, he said, while we are blessed with a multitude of fine commentaries, they can prove to be almost useless if we cannot follow the linguistic arguments involved. So point four is because they enable you to, to follow commentaries. Silva says that this problem becomes critical if the pastor has a well-educated congregation. Basically the same thing that Lloyd-Jones was saying earlier. And, and Lloyd-Jones had an educated congregation in the heart of London. And you may have that too if you pastor. He says this problem is even greater if some of the members are college students who find themselves bombarded by the arguments of unbelieving professors. Inability by the pastor to provide reasonable responses to pressing questions can prove destructive in some sensitive situations. Once again, Silva, like Lloyd-Jones, is stressing that people were, are not in your congregation that you preach to are not likely to rise above your level and that you want to set that level high so that if they need to rise to your level, that they have that access. They need that shepherding, and you can provide it. But if you can't follow the arguments that are going on in the standard commentaries because you can't read Greek or Hebrew, there is a level of detail that you will miss. There will be opportunities that in God's good providence, you won't be able to take up. I don't want to make anybody feel guilty this morning for not taking up opportunities that were never given to you. But maybe there are people who ought to feel guilty because there are opportunities for you and you haven't taken them. Every one of you, and I don't know your backgrounds, uh, except the very few of you that I know personally, but you're wealthy enough to have something that nobody in the history of the world until very recently has had. And that is a computer with a camera and a connection to the internet. If you can connect to the internet, you can find resources on Greek and Hebrew. We'll talk about a few of them. I remember the first time that I picked up a commentary, I remember noticing that it just didn't do anything for me. I wasn't really tracking with it. I think it was J.N.D. Kelly. I, I want to say it was on the pastoral epistles. It was, it's been a long time ago now. Um, I noticed over the years that I've gotten more and more out of commentaries, and two things help me now, I think, follow commentaries. One is studying the passage on my own before looking at, common, looking at commentaries. That, that, that raises for me the questions that the commentaries will answer. If I don't do this, I find that I don't understand the commentaries quite as well. The second thing that's helped me follow commentaries is knowing Greek and Hebrew. Good commentaries on both the Old and the New Testament they dig into the grammar and the vocabulary of Hebrew and Greek. And even if all of the Hebrew and Greek words are relegated to the footnotes, as they commonly are, even in very good commentaries like the New International Commentary on the Old and New Testaments, um, it's still easier to follow what the commentators are saying if you know what's going on. And if you have the New International Greek Testament Commentary or the Word Biblical Commentary, which places Greek and Hebrew words directly in the body of the text, you're going to have a difficult time following <clears throat> if you can't even piece together those words at all. <coughs> I'm not often going to know Greek or Hebrew, certainly, um, better than the major scholarly commentators. You know, We're not expecting pastors and even most Bible college professors 
We're not expecting them to know Greek and Hebrew as well as the people who've dedicated their entire lives to this pursuit. So I do defer to the scholars, but I have no hope of weighing one against another if I can't read Greek or Hebrew. Um, I am really at their mercy, and that isn't good either. Even though I acknowledge the superiority of the Greek and Hebrew skill of, let's say, a Douglas Moo or a Bruce Waltke, uh, New Testament and Old Testament respectively, um, I'm not here to blindly follow what they tell me. I need to be able to weigh their arguments as much as possible. And the most important way that I can pick up the skill of doing that is by learning the original languages myself. Now, um, I don't know if you can see the uh, uh, all the way across the world here, but I've got my tongue and my cheek for this next point, okay? Do you know what that means? This is a joke, but it's gonna make a point. Point number five, because learning the original languages will help you impress people with your superior knowledge. You will put people in their place and you will be able to lord your learning over them. They won't dream of contradicting or even doubting your theology because you can read Greek. And if you can read Hebrew and you're single, beautiful, godly women will fall at your feet as dead. One of them will marry you on the spot and you'll finally persuade all your theological opponents that they're wrong and your church will grow and your car will stop having problems and you'll be happy, healthy, and wise. No, 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 it doesn't work that way. Actually, I'm with Moises Silva who says that as he got to know Greek better, his references to it in sermons decreased. I live by the wisdom of the great Greek guru, the late Greek guru, Rod Decker, who said, I often tell my students that if you cannot show a local church audience the meaning of a passage from an English Bible, then you should think twice as to whether you really want to insist on a particular interpretation. Did you catch that? The big temptation when you learn Greek and Hebrew is to show it off. It does give you the feeling of raising yourself up above others and putting them down. I'm not going to say it's always wrong to reference Greek and Hebrew. I think it's good for people who hear your preaching to know that you know Greek and Hebrew. And that means you have to make some kind of references to it. But I would say that most of the time I hear preachers reference Greek or Hebrew, most of the time, they say at least something that isn't quite right. Usually something very minor, but sometimes it's a bigger problem. We'll be talking about exegetical fallacies in a future lecture, and I'll give greater specification there. Very often in my experience, um, the interpretation these preachers give really is fine, but the way they present their views is the problem. They have, that, that has the unintended consequence of giving their hearers permission to leave all the Bible study to the professionals. If you talk about Greek and Hebrew in such a way that it implies that you have to know them in order to be godly and to really get the Bible, you gotta be really careful about that because you don't ever want to discourage people from reading their Bible on their own. I wanted to add this point after the previous point because I want to make certain to say that God does not call everyone to learn Greek and Hebrew. Now, I, I believe people can lead, live godly and obedient lives without that knowledge. If, if, if all they have is God's word and translation, that's wonderful. That's an, an, an inestimable treasure, and they can do so much with it. Even some of the greatest theologians of the church, St. Augustine, who is massively influential, did not read Greek. He read Latin. He read the Bible in translation. Um, knowing the original languages should never lift you up in pride. So I am extremely careful in my mentioning of Greek and Hebrew while teaching in the church because I never want to give anyone implicit permission to read, to, to, to forget reading the Bible on their own. I never want to discourage lay people from serious Bible study as if only the professionals can do it. I, I often think of what World Magazine writer Andre Sue said in an article actually about head coverings. She said, I appreciate biblical scholarship, but it is rarely conclusive. The question is this, when push comes to shove, do I go with Christian peer pressure or, Christian peer pressure or with God's word as I see it? Every one of us will give account of himself to God. I'll follow up on Andre Sue's comment. I must never undercut that truth by my use 
of Greek or Hebrew in Bible teaching. I got a, a question here. Great, some comments. Um, oh, what is the title of a book by Silva? That particular quotation did come from Foundations of Contemporary Interpretation, and I will give you, um, I will give you that in the notes afterwards. Rod Decker's comment is also linked there. I think I've got everything attributed, every quote that I give today, you'll see in the notes. Um, and Matt Rowley says, would you say something like, in the original language, Jesus is emphasizing I am when he says, I am the bread of life. Uh, in all honesty, um, I'm, I'm just, I, I think that I would apply Decker's comment there, that if you can't make the, uh, this comment from English, then I wouldn't make it. Um, that may mean that there, there are times when I fail to say something that's true, because there, there are going to be times when there's a level of specificity um, that, that only comes from the knowledge of the Greek and Hebrew. But in that particular instance, um, I frankly am a little bit skeptical about the way that um, interpreters, and even in sometimes good com otherwise good, commentary, co good commentaries, will talk about emphasis in the Greek language. Um, sometimes we talk about, we'll, we'll get into this a little, bit long, uh, a little bit later, we talk about Greek as if it is the world's most perfect and precise language. And we talk about it sometimes as if we are native speakers of it when we aren't. <laughs> I now regularly come across interpretive questions that, and I come to, and the conclusion I come to is, you know, I would have to be a native speaker to really get this nuance. I am not sure that when Jesus said, I am the bread of life, he was emphasizing the I am. I think I could say that he is alluding to the statement of God at the burning bush, but I can get that from English. I don't need Greek to tell me that. I do need Greek to check my accuracy on that before I make that comment to the people, but I'm gonna make the comment without referencing Greek. Thanks for the link there, Joel. That's a great book. Um, there are several other books in there by uh, Poitras and B. Phillips Long that are very much worth having. That's a great question, Matthew. Um, number six, <clears throat> why do we learn the original languages? Because Moises Silva said so. And it really isn't just Silva, it's everybody. You could say because wise people said so. Now there's a general biblical principle to listen to wise people bow down before the gray head, it says. No faithful Bible teacher who has spent years in Greek or Hebrew study will tell you that that time was all wasted. There's a reason Greek and Hebrew are part of the curriculum of so many seminaries. There's a reason we're talking about it now. And it's that a whole lot of people with experience have seen the value. And it's a terrible shame, in my mind at least, that as I hear the requirements for Greek and Hebrew learning are being lessened in seminaries all around the world. Here, here's just one more quotation from a person who knew a thing or two about the Greek New Testament. Here's Erasmus of Rotterdam. He said, advantages accrue to those who would rather draw their knowledge of scripture from the purest springs than from such streams and pools as may be handy. Did you catch that? For centuries, many, many, many of the people who studied scripture got it chewed up and spit out first in translation and not in, uh, not straight from the streams and pools of the original. They got it from the streams and pools that were handy. He said, so often they were poured from one of them into another, not to say fouled by the muddy feet of swine and asses. He means donkeys, of course. No, fruit tastes better that you have picked with your own hands from the mother tree. Water is fresher that you draw as it bubbles up from the actual spring. In the same way, the scriptures have about them some sort of natural fragrance. They, they breathe something genuine and pecul peculiarly their own when read in the language in which they were first written. That's true. I feel like I'm going a little bit back and forth between poles here. You don't want to stress it too much as if you can't get the water of life from translation because you can. But it is true that translation can muddy matters a little bit. We're generally not talking about major matters of doctrine, just little things. 
But every little thing God says is something I want to, by his, his grace, understand, if at all possible. Wise people are going to tell you, experienced people are going to tell you, do this. It's worth it if you get the opportunity. Number seven, here's Because Moises Silva Said So, part two. I love Silva and I'm relying on him. And this comment has come back to me so many times. There is, a, to use a French phrase, a je ne sais quoi going on here. And that means I know not what. I love what Silva says. He says, quite possibly the most significant value of knowing the biblical languages is intangible in character. What does that mean? It means you're not always able to explain it. This is the non-reason reason for learning original languages. Uh, most of us are conditioned to think, Silva says, that nothing is truly valuable that doesn't have an immediate and concrete payoff. Yet, most of the teaching that we have received from birth is of a different nature altogether. We are simply not conscious of how deeply we've been molded by countless experiences that, that affect our perspective, our thinking, our decisions. And Silva says, similarly, a measure of proficiency in the biblical languages provides the overall framework that promotes responsibility in the handling of the biblical text. Continued exposure to the original text expands our horizon and furnishes us with a fresh and more authentic perspective than that which we bring from our modern English-speaking situation. And if you catch what Silva said, it was similar to what Erasmus said, but he, he himself, with all of his training and learning in this area, and he's a major leader in the evangelical use of the original languages. He is a model commentator, commentator on Galatians, for example. Uh, he himself is basically saying, I can't always put my finger on that value, but I know it's there. It shapes me in ways that I don't even always discern. I came across um, a comment from Alistair McGrath that I think help, helps explain that I don't know what, that thing that's hard to put your finger on. Uh, he was talking about humane letters more generally, that is the, the liberal arts and literature in particular. And he was speaking about C.S. Lewis and his biography of Lewis, um, which is a good biography, C.S. Lewis, A Life. And he, he talks about the history of education in Britain um, one that Lewis, of course, was a major beneficiary of. And he said, Oxford undergraduates studying the humane letters were required to engage directly with the literary, philosophical, and historical riches of the classical age in the original languages, not simply as a subject of academic interest, but as a means of ensuring England's survival and prosperity. I don't know how it is in other countries right now, but in America, there is a... Uh, a pretty massive fight over the value of the humanities, literature, art, and music in a very utilitarian age in which the supreme value is the pleasure I can get through money right now, and in which people's trust in the authorities of Western culture has eroded greatly. Um, it's less and less apparent to people why they should spend four years studying the Greek classics. And it's more and more apparent to people that the way to prosperity and success is to study STEM, the uh, science, technology, engineering, and what is the M? Boy, I forget now. Uh, mathematics, duh. STEM fields are rising and the humanities are being uh, squeezed out. Their budgets are shrinking. Their departments are shrinking. Why is this happening? No one person is causing it. It's a cultural malaise, a culture that has lost confidence in its own heritage, the Western heritage. The English of Lewis's day saw clearly what we don't see, that if you engage directly with the original texts, it's not merely a subject of individual academic interest, but it's a means of ensuring the nation's survival and prosperity. And I think I could say the same for the church. The humane letters, McGrath says, were seen as a gateway to wisdom rather than the mere accumulation of knowledge. It was about the moral and cultural preparation for life, not simply the acquisition of factual information. And, and he says the same thing Silva does. Where other courses of study might aim merely to fill undergraduate minds, this one set out 
to shape them. You know, you, as you grow in your ability to interpret scripture and teach it to others, I think you will look back over your history and be puzzled at times as to why was it that in 2017, this particular question occurred to me when I know I have read this passage many times previously. You won't know, you can't know exactly where that came from in your life. But in order to encourage good interpretive questions, you need to be shaped by many influences, including, Lord willing, if at all possible, the study of the original languages. I think McGrath hits the right note. I am telling you that knowing Greek and Hebrew, they shape your mind. They don't just fill it. It's precisely the assumption that Greek and Hebrew will stock your mind with word meanings that gets people in trouble. If you think of Greek and Hebrew as this distinctive set of vocabulary that is just going to be downloaded into your brain hard drive, there's a, that's, it's not 100% wrong, but it's pretty close. Um, no, you just have to trust wise people who've told you that knowing the original languages will shape you, even if they can't quite explain it. They know it. I know it. Do it. Learn Greek first, then Hebrew. It's my recommendation, if by God's grace, you possibly can. Um, Joel makes a comment. Let's say putting together the shape of Hebrew poetry, how can that really come through in another language? Good. Um, thankfully, when it comes to Hebrew poetry, the parallelism is more easily translated than rhyming would be for us. But there are times when, and one of my favorite examples is, um, I think it's in Romans, and I'm going to look it up real quick here. The modern translations, at least one of them, does something pretty brilliant that shows off what translation can't always do. It's Romans 131, if you're able to turn there. And let's go back a couple of verses to Romans 129. So Paul, and I'll be reading the ESV here, is describing the wicked of all generations and he says, they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips. Thank you, Joel, for putting that there. Slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. And then look at this, the last phrase that Joel put in the comments. Foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. No other translation, and I'm looking at a bunch of them right now. No other translation that I can see does this uh, except for actually a Roman Catholic translation, the New American Bible. And actually, the New American Bible one-ups the ESV because the Greek, um, let me read to you the words in the Greek, um, not to show off, but you're going to hear the, uh, a particular repeated sound, asunetus, asu, asunfetus, Astorgus, ana, anelemenas, uh, sorry, anelemenas. Um, it is difficult to pronounce Greek words correctly at 5.44 a.m. <clears throat> sorry. There's a little alpha privative at the beginning of every one of those words. That alpha privative functions like the suffix less in the translations faithless, heartless, ruthless. Now, that there's a, an alliteration there that was inspired by God and written with brilliance by the Apostle Paul. And it's almost impossible to bring it across in translation in, I'm going to assume, most of the languages of the world. The, the, the possibility that the best translation of those words happens to have some kind of similar alpha privative <coughs> is it's just very low you're going to lose that nuance in almost every translation. It's just a stroke of, frankly, luck, or I'd better say God's providence, that there are English equivalents that at least have a suffix which allows them this consonance, faithless, heartless, rootless, that picks up on what Paul's doing here. The New American Bible has, they are senseless, faithless, heartless, rootless, ruthless. 
whereas the ESV has foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Um, that, that less suffix brilliantly picks up on the alliteration that's going on in the Greek. But that's a great example of what usually you just can't do. Um, and if you, let me give my opinion on whether you should mention Greek here too. Um, I think this might be a rare occasion in which, uh, extremely rare occasion in which you, you could possibly read the Greek words if you think that people will hear that alliteration. Personally, I would simply point to it in English. I, I, I want to be better safe than sorry. Um, I, I might say something like, uh, Paul here uses uh, the full skill of, you know, his full literary skill, and you can even see the, uh, the, 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 uh, the echoes of word after word in Romans 131. I, I, I even here, I don't want to suggest to someone implicitly that they need Greek in order to really understand. Um, I, I, it feels awkward to be in the place of saying to people, even implicitly, that here's something in the Greek that they don't need to know. But if the fact is that most people in the world cannot learn it, they don't, aren't given that opportunity by God, even though it's in the text, even though God inspired it, it must not be something that everybody has to know in order to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to be very careful about how I mention Greek in sermons. Okay, point eight. Learn the original languages because seeing another country is the best way to see your own with clarity. My best effort to find a metaphor to explain how Greek and Hebrew shapes you comes from travel. I was listening to an interview that Al Mohler, president of Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, did with the, uh, the most theologically astute U.S. Senator that we've got right now, as far as I know, Senator Ben Sass, who has a PhD in history from Yale and is a committed evangelical Christian and an articulate one. Um, ben said that pretty much all the well-rounded, effective people he knew had some kind of formative travel experience. And I thought back to my own life history, and I thought, yes, I never saw America's wealth, which I grew up with. It was all around me. I never saw it until I saw Peru, and I saw the poverty there. I never saw America's dirtiness and its public devotion to consumerism until I saw Germany and its cleanliness and the fact that there weren't any billboards on the side of the highway. It never occurred to me that there might be a country that didn't have billboards on the side of the highway until I went to one that was like that. I never saw America's absolute dedication to speed, including fast food. I never saw it for what it was until I ate dinner in a restaurant in Italy and the waiters were notably, noticeably offended that my team of American singers um, wanted to leave as soon as we did. We were done with our meal and didn't want to stick around. That's just not the culture there. I never saw my own culture's relational poverty until I saw how often the large Mexican family that's next door to me as we speak gets together. That, and, and I heard all the family fun they have. It's seeing the way other cultures, other countries do things that enables you to see your own culture with clarity. It is excessively difficult to look at your own cultural lenses because they're stuck to your face and they've been there your entire life. Maybe there are people listening here who live in multicultural situations where you're forced to recognize your own cultural assumptions all the time. I think that there's some real health there. And I think this insight applies to languages too because I had a parallel experience learning Latin in junior high. I remember all of a sudden noticing things in English, not just that I didn't notice before, but that I couldn't notice before. Until you see how Latin or Greek or Hebrew do things, you may not see your own native language in its true light. And you certainly won't grasp all the interpretive impossibilities and possibilities in scripture. You'll be limited without access to the originals. This truth shouldn't offend anyone. There, there is a limitation to your biblical interpretation if you cannot read Greek and Hebrew. 
That's always going to be the case. You can still get truth. You can still be saved. You can still teach the Bible with accuracy and care and love. You can still read it with spiritual profit, but there will be these details that you miss. And the fact is that when you teach people week after week after week in a church or in a school or both, you are necessarily going to be teaching them something about their own language. You are going to be modeling for them how to interpret the Bible using the translations that are available to them in their native tongue, which may or may not be your native tongue. Probably is. And as you teach in Tagalog, or whatever language it is that God has given you as your heart language, you will be, you'll be parsing um, the forms of Tagalog. You'll be parsing the forms of French or German or English or Spanish or whatever language it is that you're preaching in. Um, you'll be doing it implicitly and explicitly. You'll be talking about nouns and verbs and adjectives. You'll need to know your own language well in order to teach people. And one of the best ways to get clarity about your own language and the way it works is to learn other languages. Now that works, you know, even if it's not Greek and Hebrew, but why not let it be Greek and Hebrew? Those are the most important foreign languages I think pretty much any Christian could spend his or her time learning. Number nine, and we've got 10 reasons here. So we're coming toward the end of this hour of this lecture. Number nine, we learn the original languages because knowing the originals helps you know when to be satisfied with the level of interpretive precision that you've reached. Now, I confess, I had a little trouble coming up with a good example of this from scripture. So instead, I'll relate that when I entered seminary, I had a very specific goal. I wanted to be able to interpret scripture with the confidence that I had access to basically all the relevant tools. I had not an empty tool belt when I entered seminary, but I had a tool belt that had a lot of empty slots in it. I wanted to have access to the very best that the church's gifted Bible teachers could do to interpret a given passage. I wanted to have access to the best commentaries, the best grammars, the best dictionaries, the best articles. I wanted to know how and where to find answers to my questions. I also wanted to put as many of those exegetical tools into my own hands, not just the ability to go read what others write, but I wanted to be able to parse the originals for myself. And so I focused a lot on linguistic tools and I'm very thankful that I did. Now, I do not have a perfect understanding of all of scripture. I'll never achieve that until glory perhaps, when it, the Bible says e only then will we know as also we are known. But I've, I've definitely got exegetical tools in my hand that I didn't have when I started seminary. And I've got tools in my hand that make me suspicious when someone wants to make a point that is finer, more detailed than I think the grammar permits. Now, this is more common in Greek than in Hebrew for me because I was New Testament major and I spent more time on Greek. It's also more common in Greek because the nature of the literature, particularly Paul's epistles, calls for a finer grained analysis in preaching typically than does the Hebrew. I'm not at all putting down Hebrew or saying that it isn't patient of fine grammatical analysis, um, but we tend to treat Paul's epistles with that type of uh, very narrow care and naturally don't, don't treat every word of a narrative that way. If anything, it's because they're so large and we don't have the time to do that. Now, this did happen the other day, and this is a very minor example, but it'll have to do. Acts 12, 7, and if, uh, Joel, you could put the ESV up there, Acts 12, 7, um, and Joel, I've got a, a tip for you on an app that can automatically put in uh, Bible verses even faster than Accordance can do, and, and Logos, I have to admit. I'll have to tell you about it later. It's in Alfred, but this is what the verse says, and behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. This is... Um, Peter, he struck Peter on the side and woke him saying, get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. Okay, this is extremely minor, but it, it is an example. The Greek, if I read it extremely literally and use the same word order, goes like this. 
and fell his the chains from the hands. That word his could be modifying chains or it could be modifying hands. It's ambiguous. It could be his chains fell from the hands or it could be the chains fell from his hands. Now, I think it's obvious which one is more natural English, but the verse is not exhaustively precise. And if someone wanted to really insist that it was either one of these options, I'd, I'd be suspicious. I wanna be content to stop with the level of precision that the grammar actually gives. And knowing Greek is what makes me feel content. It gives me all the interpretive options. Um, I speak some Spanish. I, I always say I'm about 70% fluent there, not 100%. But in Spanish, you don't say his hands. You say the hands. So though I haven't checked, and boy, now I think I want to check. I'm going to check my Spanish translations. Uh, Acts 12, 7, what do they do? Um, they, yeah, yeah, some of them don't use the word um, his at all. They say the hands. It doesn't look to me like any of them translates uh, saying his chains. No, I looked at them all and they don't. I've got about eight or ten Spanish translations. Um, but as far as I can tell, it's grammatically possible. If someone wanted to insist on either view, all I'm saying is um, I can see the Greek and I can see that the Lord in his wisdom left those interpretive options open. And that happens at more serious places. And in a future version of this lecture, if I ever give it, hopefully I'll find a better example than that one. And we've reached at, we've reached number 10, following which I'll give you a couple of practical suggestions and then we'll have a break. Number 10. And this may seem an odd point, but I think it's important to say. We learn the original languages because it's a Protestant tradition. I don't know if all of you view yourselves as Protestants, but you're listening to one most definitely. In the 500th anniversary of the 1517 nailing of the 95 Theses to the church door at Wittenberg by Martin, Martin Luther, I am very proud and extremely grateful to God to be a Protestant. And I think that this particular tradition that Protestants have of learning the original languages is an absolutely, boy, what can I say? I, I just can't come up with um, with superlatives great enough to say how important I think this is to Protestantism. Something really changed in Christianity when in the Reformation, vernacular Bibles were put out. Vernacular Bibles translated from the Greek and Hebrew and not from the Latin Vulgate. We've got a new Latin, we've got a new Vulgate that's trying to rear its ugly head right now. There are people who are translating the King James Version into other languages. In Spanish, they've got the Rey Jaime Version, and they've got great uh, renderings in there, such as when it says in the King James, as Jesus is on the cross, and they cast the same in his teeth, meaning the people mocked him as they went by him on the cross. The Spanish there says, y echaron lo mismo en sus dientes, which is absolutely meaningless and has the effect of taking those words out of people's hands. Here's God's words, God gives them to people, and the translators of the, the Rey Jaime version remove those words from any possibility of people understanding them. I am told by a friend who went to a King James only college in, um, in the US, but is from Korea, I am told that there are either four or five, I can't recall, it's one of those two, four or five translations in Korean of the King James. This is an absolute betrayal of the heritage of Protestantism and of the Reformation in particular. We got translations taken from the pure spring, not taken from bottled water as it were. One of my friends who has moved from independent Baptist fundamentalism through conservative Presbyterianism and into Anglicanism, told me that if I pushed him hard enough, he would fall into Roman Catholicism. And I'm not comfortable with that. I tried to dissuade him, 
were not close enough that I could put extreme pressure on him, but I raised questions, definitely. And as we talked, it struck me um, that one of my biggest arguments against Roman Catholicism is the comparison of the end results of the two traditions, the Protestant tradition versus the Roman Catholic tradition. You'll recognize there's a lot of variation in each tradition, but there's something recognizably called Protestant, something recognizably called Roman Catholic. I don't care to deny that the Roman Catholic tradition does some good, genuine good, or, and I certainly don't care to deny that Protestants have something to learn from individual Roman Catholics or from all of Roman Catholicism. Not everything, not everything the Pope says is false. And I want to be very careful to represent them fairly based on their doctrinal statements in the Catholic Catechism. But I don't think it's irrelevant to point out that in all my experience with Roman Catholic and evangelical churchgoers, it's extremely clear, clear to me which one of those groups knows the Bible better. I always think of the rosary. Ask any Catholic I've ever met, and no, I haven't met them all, but we all have to generalize because none of us has universal experience. Uh, anyway, ask a Catholic whether scripture might have something to say about praying repetitive prayers, and I think they'll draw a blank. It will feel suspicious to him that you even ask such a question. Why are you setting the, the, the scripture potentially against the tradition? But if you ask an evangelical uh, whether scripture might have something to say about praying repetitive prayers, I'd like to think that a lot of them at least will come up with what Jesus said in Matthew 6. When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. And what's more, the first impulse of an evangelical, of a Reformation Protestant, is to question his tradition, not Jesus, not question Jesus. Roman Catholic theology does have an interpretation of that verse in the Sermon on the Mount, which permits rosary beads. I link to it in the notes. It's mentioned briefly in the Catholic Catechism, but I'm not buying it. The healthiest thing about the Protestant evangelical tradition, and it is a tradition, is its emphasis on sola scriptura, and consequently on personal Bible study for all and on uh, for the clergy, for the Bible teachers in the church, an emphasis on studying the Bible in its original languages, if at all possible. The force of tradition is so powerful, um, it can make void the word of God. And one of the ways it does that is when it takes the word of God and gets it at one or two removes away from us. Um, whether because our customs make us blind to things the Bible says, um, or because we, we uh, lack the capacity to question traditions because we don't see the nuances in the Greek or the Hebrew. Um, the famous example here from the Latin Vulgate is the translation, do penance which Luther translated differently, and he did so rightly. Um, that little uh, shading, that little error in the Vulgate, got the church, gave the church uh, permission to do something that it shouldn't have been doing, namely in um, taking confessions from people. In order to have personal Bible study, we have to have vernacular translations. In order to have vernacular translations, that means translations made into the language that people actually speak and write, we have to have translators who know Greek and Hebrew. And in order to use our translations well, we have to have at least some people in every area, preferably pastors and elders, but not only that, some people who know Greek and Hebrew and can answer people's questions about the finer points. So a few practical suggestions. I'll, not everybody here that's watching or reading this lecture will have the opportunity to study Greek and Hebrew formally in a classroom. If you have that option, I say take it. Uh, for me, at least, it is the easiest way to learn the language. To be in a class is the easiest way to learn a lot of hard things because someone else sets the structure and the motivation and they, someone else provides important feedback when you do things wrong because you will. And I'd like to point out that one of the best things about a uh, classroom school, and we're trying our best to do that here, um, is that your teacher is, you're actually inviting your teacher to tell you that you're wrong. I was just talking to my own pastor yesterday about this. He's in school as well. He's going for a THM at a seminary in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And he travels there every year and he writes long papers. 
In our church, it's generally inappropriate and counterproductive for someone in the church to tell the pastor that he's wrong. Now, there may be times when that needs to happen, but that can raise really awkward situations in Sunday school. Um, it can build, make a tension there that um, is unhealthy. Um, you know, at, at, at best, if you needed to question a pastor, ask him the question. Don't say that he's wrong. Um, there's a hierarchy in the church, and there's a respect that you show to someone whom God has placed above you. And, and I do that. I defer to him, um, my own pastor, my God-given pastor. But in school, your teacher not only can say, you're wrong, you're actually paying him to do that. The, the whole structure is set up so that the teacher um, is, you're, tr you're trying to get the teacher to correct you. That's why you're paying your money, you're spending your time, or both. And um, I actually copied out a statement some time ago, let me bring it up here. Somebody said that the original languages give us the clear understanding of the original intended meaning to the scripture. Somebody else said, and I can't remember quite what it was earlier in the comments, I'm not gonna be able to find it while talking, um, but that um, in translation, we don't you know, get the full word of God. And I'm not gonna say you are wrong, but I'm gonna say, be extremely careful with that. Um, can we get a clear understanding of the original intended meaning of the scripture through translation? I'm gonna say, say generally, yes. The New Testament itself cites the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, repeatedly and doesn't flinch while doing so, doesn't correct that translation. Not that we can never do that. Uh, we need to at times. Um, but I w I'm the teacher and here I am saying, no, I wouldn't say it that way. You need that. Uh, if you can study the original languages in a school, then definitely do it. Um, but if God in his providence doesn't give you this opportunity, you aren't off the hook. There are so many good resources now available online for self-study, and I've included a bunch of them in the notes that I'll be sending out to you. Some links to a course that my company, Lagos Bible Software, makes. Uh, there's a Bible Mesh course. Bill Mounts has courses in Greek and in Hebrew. He's actually got two courses in Greek, as best I can tell. There's the Daily Dose of Greek from Robert Plummer at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. It's more of a refresher, um, but a few months of diligent labor with a free intro course on the internet might make it possible for you to start following all or at least most of what Plummer says in these videos. There's also the Daily Dose of Hebrew from Mark Futado, who is a, a big name in Hebrew and Old Testament studies. Um, I don't have personal experience with these courses because in God's providence, I was put in a classroom and that's where I knew I'd learn best. But the value of Greek and Hebrew is so great that I've, I've got to put some options out there for you to consider. And, and maybe you are not called to learn Greek or Hebrew, but, but look around you. Here's my final appeal. How many men and women in your circle of churches or in your entire nation of churches, how many of them know these languages? Even if you don't think you are particularly gifted with the time or ability to learn, Perhaps God is tapping you on the shoulder right now. Perhaps he's saying, you, go do it. The very fact that you're sitting here watching a lecture in advanced hermeneutics is a self-selection process. You're already probably the kind of person who could or should learn the original languages. Somebody in your culture, somebody has to, multiple somebodies, or you will not have the word of God in continuing generations you'll get a Vulgate. You'll get a translation provided to you by missionaries, maybe helped with some original language consultants, native consultants, but you won't have, um, you won't have the full suite of resources that uh, a healthy, mature church needs in a given nation and people group. They need commentaries. Who's gonna write those commentaries? It's gotta be people who uh, read Greek and Hebrew if you wanna have accuracy. Um, Maybe God is tapping you on the shoulder. Maybe he's asking you to do it. And I would say, yes, you, go do it. We'll take our break now. I'll let you take it over, Joel. Tell us what to do. Excellent, excellent. Really, really enjoying this. Thank you.
Um, so many points along the way that I thought were really great. Very good stuff. Okay, let's take a five minute break. Uh, I've got 10 after the hour. Some of you have 40 after the hour. So we'll just come back in five minutes. Uh, that's gonna be 15 minutes after the hour. And we will continue with this. Good stuff, thank you very much. We'll see you in five minutes. Um, Joel has given an outline, which I have followed, and the next thing he asked me about was how not to use original languages. And we're gonna dig a lot more deeply into exegetical fallacies in a future lecture. So for now, let me keep it more general by warning you briefly about uh, two simple things. One is correcting the translations that uh, you use in your churches. Um, I've got a lot of experience hearing pastors do this, and I, probably at times I must have done it myself. But at least in recent years, I have tried to back off of um, correcting translations publicly. Instead, I will, I will emphasize that if a given translation of the Bible says X, Y, or Z, it almost certainly has a good reason for doing so, even if I can't see it. Um, yes, translations can do boneheaded things. So the NIV translators in 1984 translated sarks, that is the Greek word commonly translated flesh. They translated it as sinful nature in multiple contexts. And that proved to be unhelpful and misleading. Um, it actually proved to be making a metaphysical claim that they realized was inappropriate. In their effort to communicate the scriptures more clearly, they actually did muddy the waters. Um, and they themselves came along and revised it and said that they had been wrong to do so. So yes, that kind of thing does happen. And for a very serious theological issue, like how many natures does a person have? Do you have a sinful nature and a Christian nature maybe you would need to correct um, a translation. But I, be, I would be very wary about doing that because of a principle I brought up earlier that I don't want to undercut the confidence that the people, the sheep in front of me that I'm shepherding, the confidence that they have in the Bible. I want them to be encouraged that if they pick up their Bibles, they'll actually get something out of it. I want to equip them with the skills to do so and if I am frequently setting myself up above the common Bible translations, plural, or even just the one that is used in my uh, people group, whether it is English or Tagalog or what have you, then um, I could be guilty both of the arrogance that says I know better than other people um, and I could be guilty of undercutting people's faith in scripture. The fact is that nobody who sits down to translate uh, a Bible, and, and certainly nobody in the more, uh, more or less evangelical sphere, and in English we have many evangelical translations, good ones, none of these people um, has a self-conscious ax to grind they are working extremely hard and have dedicated their lives to translating the Bible, to teaching the Bible. In fact, translating the Bible is part of their calling to teach, to teach the Bible. And uh, these are gifted men and women who've got training that typically exceeds that of pastors. Um, and for pastors to question them publicly, um, I think is counterproductive. Um, in most of my experience, you want to be really humble and extremely confident that you're right before you suggest that a given translation is flat out wrong. You could use relative terminology like, you know, I think this particular rendering is more effective in getting the truth across. But by that, by saying that you're implying that the translation you're criticizing is still getting the truth across because it is. Even if, this is what the King James translator said, even the very meanest translation of the word of God set into our tongue is, contains the word of God, no, is the word of God. That's what they said. 
even if all you had was a not very good translation, you would still have uh, incredible riches. You would have God's words. Yes, we want the very best translations we can have, but another reason that I don't go around questioning translations um, is that um, I don't think of my goal in reading Bible translations or comparing them as finding the best one. I'm looking for the most useful one because there are usefully different uh, methods of translation of scripture. And it's, it's as simple as saying that there are passages that if I read them in only one translation, I wouldn't be understanding. The one that always comes to my mind is Psalm 16, 6. Very literally, the King James has it. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage, O Lord. <clears throat> and I read that and memorized it for decades. And I didn't understand it. I didn't know what the lines were. And I stupidly never thought to even ask the question. Um, one of the great values of using multiple translations, and I could give multiple lectures on the use of multiple translations, is that it slows you down enough to notice things that you wouldn't notice. It makes you ask questions you wouldn't think to ask. And I was reading the New International Version, which when I grew up and where I grew up was pilloried. People hated it. They thought it was terrible, this translation, the New International Version. There was a prominent King James only leader who called it not the NIV New International Version, but the NIV Nutty Idiots Version. And even though my church wasn't that extreme growing up, that was still the attitude. Why would anyone want to read this, you know, terrible corruption of the Word of God? Well, that terrible corruption of the Word of God in Psalm 16, 6 gave me the secret hidden key, which wasn't secret or hidden, um, to understanding. It said, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. And I said, duh, He's talking in metaphorically about his, his lot, his, his land. The boundary lines have fallen in such a way that he gets a really good land. And that was a metaphor for his relationship with God. And I totally didn't get it. I don't think the King James translators misled me or did anything wrong. Um, I'm only saying that because the NIV has a more dynamic or functionally equivalent translation philosophy, um, uh, willing to bring out nuances of the original with a little added interpretive specificity, I got it, and I didn't get it before. That has happened to me over and over and over and over and over again. Um, when, I, when I talk about how not to use the original languages, my, my first point is don't, go, don't use your knowledge of the originals to question um, publicly the faithful and careful work of godly people who, yes, maybe you disagree with them, but think about the implications of disagreeing with them in front of everybody in the church before you go and do it. That's what I would say. A second um, problem, how not to use the original languages, and this will just be brief, and then we'll move on to a philosophy of words because we don't have much time. Um, I would say I, re I regularly hear preachers say that Greek was chosen by God um, they don't say this about Hebrew typically, but they say Greek was chosen by God because of its exceptional precision, the most precise language in the history of mankind, something like that. Um, for one thing, how many preachers out there um, know all the languages of the world? <laughs> how many people out there know all the languages of the world? Even professional linguists who will know seven or 12 languages in seven or 12 different language families. They don't have exhaustive knowledge. We don't know this. We don't know the Greek was chosen for its exceptional precision. And it's just not accurate. Don't say it. Greek is not math. It's not algebra. Um, it, the, the very people who, who say this, that you know, Greek is exceptionally precise, usually tend to go on and make a claim for that precision, which just uh, isn't fair. They're suggesting nuances which aren't there. Um, they're making the Greek say something it really isn't saying. They are treating New Testament Greek the way my three-year-old girl used to treat my one-year-old boy when they were that age. She treated him with well-meaning, blundering over-attention that ended up making him cry. That's the way they treat Greek. Um, I've got a link in the notes you'll have to look at. Moises Silva it has a hilarious 
little piece in that book, Foundations of Contemporary Interpretation, in which he shows over-interpretation. The fact is Greek is a human language like any other. It had to be used and spoken and read and written by everybody from the, the, the top political leaders, most educated elites, down to slaves. And Paul wrote to slaves. Do we expect them to catch all the nuances that we are trying to bring out? Sometimes you can get into over much nuance and claim for the Greek what, um, what no language is really capable of, of saying in that short of a space. I'm not saying there are no nuances. Uh, I am saying we need to be really careful not to claim for Greek more than it claims for itself. Okay, let's move into a philosophy of words here. And, um, but I'll answer this question. Which book do you recommend for pastors who are teaching the Bible in terms of original language? I think I was going to say this at the end, um, but there's definitely two resources. Let me just make sure I don't miss saying this since someone asked, and that's a great question. Um, First, I would suggest Moises Silva's work, work, Biblical Words and Their Meaning. It's three bucks on Kindle, uh, depending, I suppose, on what country you're in. Everything Silva writes on linguistics is gold, including God, Language, and Scripture, which is part of Foundations of Contemporary Interpretation. But that book, Biblical Words and Their Meaning, is most definitely my top answer to that question. It, the book is a little dated. Um, we need some new work. Uh, like it to popularize discourse analysis and other uh, new emphases, newer emphases in linguistics. But as for practical application of the study of biblical languages, uh, biblical words and their meaning is definitely it. And then I want to make a suggestion that um, I've, I've never heard other uh, teachers say, makes me a little nervous to say it, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think I am. I, th I think I'm exceptionally right here, okay? Uh, because I, I constantly hear people mess up their own native tongue. Um, not that they make grammatical errors, but that the way they describe the way English works shows that they don't know how English works. And given that, I, what I said before, you are a teacher not only of the Bible, but implicitly at least of your native language when you teach the Bible, I don't know of any easier or smoother way for linguistics to go down easy than to read and listen to my favorite linguist, John McWhorter. I'm going to put that in the, uh, if I can here, send the chat to everyone. John McWhorter is the presenter on Slate's Lexicon Valley podcast. And he has a book called, actually it's a course that comes with a book, The Story of Human Language. Now that story he tells uh, uh, assumes evolution. And uh, of course I don't agree there, but other than that, it's just fantastic. I don't know a better lecturer on the entire planet in any discipline than John McWhorter. The guy is entertaining and brilliant. Um, I listen to him at double speed and I'm still getting tons and tons and tons out of him. Um, he also has a course called The Myths, Lies, and Half-Truths of Language, which um, is well worth having. I'm going to put that in the notes here, too. You'll see. That's just fantastic stuff. Anything you can read on linguistics by John McWhorter is going to help you understand, particularly English, but I think it'll apply to whatever language God has you teaching in. Obviously, you read and understand English or you wouldn't be taking this course. So definitely take a look at John McWhorter. If you don't have the opportunity to learn Greek and Hebrew, I urge you to study linguistics in your own language, particularly the fields of semantics and pragmatics. Those two fields are the ones that I think have the most direct applicability to teaching the Bible. Um, discourse analysis uh, promises that potential, but I hate to say it, but I'm, I'm, I won't say skeptical, but I, I just, I haven't yet seen the value of it. Um, the, the people who, who tout that value, I know they believe it and I know they're smart. 
and I know they're smarter than me about discourse analysis, at least, and I'm sure many, many more things. Um, but when I actually sit down to do the discourse analysis, I don't find as much benefit as I do from semantics and pragmatics, which are fields of linguistics. So that's a great question. Hope that answer is helpful to you. Um, let me then get into a philosophy of words. And I'm gonna include material here that uh, we're not gonna get into in the lecture because we've only got 30 minutes. And I want to start again with a question. I want you to raise your hand and answer this question. Who regularly uses a dictionary? You should be able to click raise hand. I'm gonna click mine because I do. I wanna see a raise of hands. Who regularly uses a dictionary? Am I the only one? Raise your hand. Let's see, I'm looking at the list here. I don't see any raised hands. Does anybody, everybody see the button? Okay, got another person at least. Keep them up, keep them up. Um, good, there's a few more stacking up. Don't feel embarrassed if you don't regularly use a dictionary. It's really okay, I'm just curious. And it's probably a good exercise for us to find the raise your hand button. Okay, I'm not presuming that the rest of you don't use dictionaries on a regular basis. Um, let me pull up my chat again. And if you, if you do, or if you don't, okay, I see some people chatting say I do. Um, great, I'm wondering now, now I'm just curious, what languages do you use? Like uh, English dictionaries, Tagalog dictionaries? Tell me in the comments, what languages? English, English and Tagalog, advanced English, Greek and Spanish, English, Greek and Hebrew, English and Tagalog, okay. Um, I, I did mean contemporary language dictionaries. English and Burmese, great. Okay, who else? English and Chinese, Greek to English, good. Hebrew and English, good. Chinese, sometimes Spanish, okay. Okay, let's think about Spanish, Tagalog, Burmese, and English dictionaries. These are languages that are spoken by real life people. They're speaking this language right now, all around the world. Um, all of these languages are spoken. Chinese, okay, thesaurus, good, um, is a dictionary-like resource. Um, now I wanna ask another question. How many of you and I'm talking about contemporary language dictionaries here. And not only am I talking about contemporary language dictionaries, I'm talking about contemporary language dictionaries of languages that you speak with at least some degree of fluency. Now I'm asking not who regularly uses a dictionary, but who has ever looked to find out the editor of your dictionary? Raise your hand uh, or lower it and then raise it. Again, let me know. And let me know in the comments, who's ever looked up the editor of a dictionary? Or tell me freely, I have not done that. <laughs> I'd like to know. Matthew Rowley is bold enough to say, not me, frowny face. Don't feel guilty, just tell me. Ping, nope, okay? Never. From Ak Chun Po, okay? Nope, no, no. <laughs> this is great. Noah. Mm. Can you repeat the question I can't hear? Okay, sorry. Um, who has ever looked to find out the editor of a dictionary? I'll put that in the comments here. Somebody looked up the editor of the Urban Dictionary. I think that's what he's saying. Okay, so I placed that uh, question in the comments. You can see it there. I wanna see the Urban Dictionary editors too. <laughs> They don't have a list of editors. They have a definition of editors that is, don't look it up. They've got, the Urban Dictionary is profane. I don't use it very often. Uh, BDAG, okay, that doesn't count. Um, Joel Arnold says he read a book about the formation of the OED. I read that book too. And yeah, that's amazing. And that, that kind of counts, that kind of counts. Uh, but not not quite, you're right. Okay, so I've got most people saying that they they haven't looked up the editor. Now, Webster is not the editor of his dictionary. He's long dead. Um, and Bauer, Donker, Arndt, and Gingrich, again, we're not talking about 
uh, original language dictionaries. We're talking about contemporary language dictionaries. So here's what I want to know. Here's why I asked this. One of the most helpful questions I can think of to help people understand the way words work and understanding the way words work is absolutely essential to the, to the job of Bible teaching. And I'm chagrined repeatedly that people don't understand the way words work. And I'm chagrined, I regret the ways in which I didn't understand it until it was beat into my head. Um, is to ask this question. This is the most helpful question I know to ask. How does the dictionary know what a word means? And we don't have enough time for me to, add, to get you, your answers on that, though you're free to mention them in the chat. And I will get to answering that question, but I want to start this discussion of a philosophy, philosophy of words, not with dictionaries, but with the creator of language, God himself. And we will build up to answering the question, how does the dictionary know what a word means? The first thing to say about any field of study, including language, is that all truth in that study, all truth in that field or discipline is God's truth. And when it comes to language and the meaning of words and grammar and syntax and proper grammar and syntax and spelling and pronunciation, every aspect of language, the true meaning, and Matthew, you're uh, predicting accurately where I'm going with this, but we need to build up to that. The true meaning of a word in a given sentence is in the mind of God. That is, God knows what I mean every time I say or write something. And he knows what you mean every time you say or write something. He knows when you or I are confused. He knows when you or I are shading the truth. He knows when you're doing your best and nonetheless you fail to communicate clearly or accurately. He knows when you use a malapropism something you didn't mean to say. You said a rhyming word or a homonym instead. He also knows what a given word means in general. That is, he knows what a word like elimocenary means. I'm going to stick that in the uh, comments there. He knows what that word means, even if the average English speaker doesn't. But think carefully with me here. Um, words don't exist apart from their use in, uh, the, in the language. Those, that set of sounds is meaningless until a group of people decides to um, inherit the decision. Implicitly, they decide. They inherit the decision to view those syllables, elimocenary, to mean something like charitable, which is what it does mean in English. People have to use words in real life for those words like elimocenary to have meaning. It doesn't have meaning if it's just sitting in a dictionary. It's like a tree falling in a forest with no one there to hear it. People have to use the words to have meaning. For, for, so for us to say that God knows what elimocenary means is to say that he knows what most people mean when they use it, because that is what dictionaries in fact tell us. They don't describe every use of every word in real life. They describe what you can distill from the majority of instances in which people use a given word. And so Achun Po and Matthew Rowley are correct to say that the, um, that the dictionary is describing common usages. It's looking at how people use the words. Iconic signification, if I'm following Elric Pelobello or Pelobello, don't know how you pronounce that. If I'm following that correctly, that's more technical terminology for what these symbols in language are communicating. And yes, that's accurate. Um, dictionaries tell us how most people use the words. Now, I'm going to get kind of philosophical and theological here, and it, it's going to go beyond my my own capacities, and I'm also going to be going beyond what scripture explicitly says. So this is some speculation here, but let me see if it's helpful to you. God doesn't merely react to what we say and then conclude, yes, that must be what elimocenary means. No, I think, and again, I admit I'm speculating here, that he in his powerful work of providence um, ensures that our respective languages, English and Tagalog and Chinese and Burmese, 
he ensures that they hang together as languages. He guides its shape. Therefore, he has some investment in what elimosinary means. That doesn't mean the word can't change in meaning, but I'm, I wanna get away from a situation in which we humans determine reality and not God. So here's my effort to do that, and it may be amateurish, but it's the fruit of some years of reflection on this. Uh, it gets you into some difficulties, my speculation does, because English is, does have cuss words. Are we going to say that God controls the meaning of those two? Well, yeah, I'm actually going to say that. Uh, language is a tool used by fallen people, and the fall affects it, but God in his providence still controls it. God is the final arbiter of meaning. But now here's the key question that's going to help me in English and Burmese and in Chinese and in Greek and Hebrew. What access do we have to the meaning of the word elimosinary in the mind of God? I'm going to put that question in the comments. Uh, you can give your answers, but we're just, I'm just going to keep going here because of time. God has not given us a Christian dictionary of English. So how can we know what he knows the word to mean? We have only one access point, and that is usage. We must watch the way other English speakers use the word. Usage determines meaning. Usage provides us access to meaning. And the same is true of Greek and Hebrew words, even though no one speaks Koine Greek anymore. Some people try, but if you listen to them on YouTube, it, it's just weird. It, um, I like the living language approach. I like the idea behind it teaching Greek, it, I, I can see some major advantages that way, but I have to imagine that a Koine Greek speaker who is brought forward in a time machine and actually heard Randall Booth speak Koine Greek, I have to imagine that he'd be chuckling. Despite Booth's amazing facility and his um, careful study of pronunciation, I just have little doubt in my mind that he's saying some things that sound really funny and silly to a native speaker. We don't have any native speakers left. Same is true of Hebrew, ancient biblical Hebrew. Um, the only access point we have to the meaning of these words is the way they're actually used in the written documents that we have. Now, we have written documents. We have inscriptions. Um, we have written documents at various levels. So we have papyri, especially in Greek, that show the way Koine Greek was used on a daily basis to talk about pigs and slaves um, to talk about marriage contracts, um, to, to send a love letter. We've, we've got these kinds of things found in old trash heaps of history. And they're, they're not trash, they're incredibly valuable because they give us the usage of Koine Greek or even <clears throat> to a minor extent, a lesser extent, um, Biblical Hebrew. Um, Greek and Hebrew words, the access we have to them is their usage as well. We have to watch how the words are used, both in and outside the Bible, to discover what they mean when coming from the pen of Paul in a particular letter. Let me, let me try to offer an illustration here to dig into uh, what, what I mean by usage determining meaning. Um, my children have been learning English largely from their parents since they were born. And when my son was three, he's now seven, uh, if he were to be sitting with me in a large crowd, and he, if he were to ask, why are all the people clapping? He would be essentially asking, what is the meaning of this applause? And my answer is going to be very situation specific. If that large crowd is in a concert hall, at a concert, and if the clapping is taking place after the music is complete. And if the clapping is being done by the audience and the performers, then we're clapping probably for the conductor. We're express expressing appreciation. When he says, why are the people clapping? I'm gonna explain that. But if we're at a political rally and people are clapping during the talk of the politician up front, or if we're at a baseball game or soccer game, and we're singing uh, in America, they sing Sweet Caroline. Um, or if a third baseman just made an awesome stab at a line drive, or if Lionel Messi just 
dribbled the ball in an incredible, uh, incredibly skillful way. Um, or if we're part of a group of preschoolers and parents making rainstorm sounds, <clears throat> or if we're clapping because maybe we're dancing the flamenco in Spain, I, my answer to why are the people clapping is going to be very different depending on the situation in which I find myself with my three-year-old. Now, my brain doesn't even stop to ask these questions. I know the situation we're in. So I say to my son, they're clapping because they enjoyed the song that woman just sang, okay? Imagining we're at a concert. But the next time we hear group clapping, he's liable to ask, why are they clapping? I didn't see a woman singing a song. And I'll explain that this time, they're clapping because that man hit the baseball over the fence or that man kicked the soccer ball into the goal then he'll start to catch on. Large groups clapping in our culture usually do so intending to convey approbation and commendation or praise. But if there's music actively playing and the clapping is rhythmic, da, 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 it means something different. He's, my, my son is quick. It won't take him more than one or two experiences with each major kind of clapping to get it. Kids are wired to pick up. Uh, what human symbols like clapping and like our words, what they mean. Context is what activates a given meaning. <clears throat> it calls it off the bench, to use a baseball metaphor, from among the other possible meanings and says, you're up. The situation calls forth the meaning from a range of options that words generally have, senses we call them. And it helps that that range in our culture is not infinite. You can use clapping to communicate various meanings, but you can't, in our culture, use clapping to say, there are three clocks out of sync in the back of our shed. There's no clapping that can say that. <clears throat> you can't even clap to say elimosinary. There's a limited range of meanings. Asking what does this word mean in Greek or Hebrew or English or anything is like asking what does clapping mean? You simply have to know something about the context in which the word takes place, in which it's used, before you can answer the question. So some words have such a narrow range of meaning that it's, it's fairly safe to answer, what does elimosinary mean, without stopping to say first, well, read me the sentence that you found it in. But with a fair number of words, it's very important to answer, what does this mean, with, well, where did you find it? What sentence was it used in? This is why James Barr, uh, the teacher of Moises Silva, encourages Bible interpreters to broaden their focus from words to sentences. And I'm not going to say anything, probably this whole, whole lecture, that's more important than this. He says, theological thought of the type found in the New Testament has its characteristic linguistic expression, not in the word individually, but in the word combination or sentence. Since important elements in the New Testament vocabulary were not technical, the attempt to relate the individual word directly to the theological thought leads to the distortion of the semantic contribution made by words in contexts. That is thick, thick verbiage, but there is wealth in there. I'm just gonna keep going, then, we'll, then I'll explain. The value of the context, Barr says, comes to be seen as something contributed by the word, and then it is read into the word as its contribution, where the context is in fact different. Thus, the word becomes overloaded with interpretative suggestion. I'm going to explain this by offering the prototypical example in my experience. I am curious whether non-English speakers do this as well, or whether it's just an English, English church English-speaking church custom and tradition. But the word agape is a classic example of a word that becomes overloaded with interpretative suggestion because people take ideas from contexts in which the word agape is used and they import them. It's called illegitimate totality transfer. They import them into their use in other contexts where they just don't work. The context clearly shows that all these other meanings just uh, don't belong. So take agape. Um, 
if we look at Ephesians 5.25, and I'm going to go ahead and put Ephesians 5.25 in, uh, in the comments here. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And now let's take Matthew 22, 37 to 41. I'll put that there too. And I'll take a real simple verse. God is love, 1 John 4, 8. Okay? The instances of the word love in these three passages all come from the word group, the root, agape. The verb form is agapao in Greek. And the Bible has a great deal more to say about love but we're just going to look at these three instances. Now, take these three ideas, just these three, which are indisputably part of the way the New Testament talks about the overall concept of Christian love. Note that, again, they all use forms of this word agape. Now, mash them together into a meaning pie, mix it all up, and pour that meaning into this sentence, which also uses agape. Okay, I'm going to put this in here, um, Luke 11, 42 to 43. I'm putting it in the comments. <laughs> Woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every kind of herb uh, and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. When you mash up work sentences that um, talk about the Christian view of love, that is the Christian practice of love, husbands love your wives like Christ self-sacrificially loved the church and gave up himself up for her, or love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, <clears throat> or God is love. When you take those things that are, are excessively true, but you import ideas from those contexts into Luke 11, 42 to 43, at first it starts, it seems to work. <clears throat> you tithe mint and ruin every herb and you neglect, neglect justice and the love of God. Here's, here's where I'm going with this, that we in the English speaking church commonly talk about agape as if it means a, a, a divine love a self-sacrificial love given to people who, uh, whether they deserve it or not, they're going to get it. A love that, as one theologian put it, Anders Nygren, is creative of value. Rather than responding to value that you see in something and your heart goes out to it in love, this kind of love, supposedly, people will say, um, creates value in the object that it loves. Now, you get into some pretty deep philosophical waters and theological waters here, and you get into extremely muddy linguistic waters when you talk about agape that way. Because look at its second use in this passage in Luke. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Wait just a minute. Can Pharisees love the best seat in the synagogues? self-sacrificially for the good of the best seat in the synagogues. Um, the way we talk about love in the evangelical church in America, the way we talk about agape in particular, we commonly say that it doesn't include any feeling. It's a rational choice to do what is best for someone else, regardless of how you feel. It is supposedly unconditional love. Can Pharisees love the best seat in the synagogues? without feeling, they're making a rational choice to choose the best seat in the synagogues, regardless of how they feel. They are choosing um, greetings in the marketplaces, regardless of how they feel. No, none of that works. <clears throat> agape and the, the agapao root, excuse me, cannot mean these things. It just doesn't work. What does agape mean? It means the same thing that the English word love means. It can be used in various contexts. You can love the chief seats at the feast. You can love God. You can love your neighbor as yourself. 
You can love your wife even as Christ loved the church. You can love ice cream. In every one of these instances, there's a, a base meaning that you can see in every one. My heart is going out to something. To say I love something is to say I really like it. Um, when you look at Greek as encoding a, a secret set of word meanings that only the Greek speakers have access to, only people who've learned Greek get it, you're liable to overinterpret. And that's dangerous when you're adding in meaning that just isn't in the context. So James Barr says, don't freight words with so much theological meaning. In general, think of meaning at the sentence level. Meaning is also at the paragraph level. It's also at the discourse level. It's at the book level. It's even at the canonical level. God wrote this entire Bible, inspired it. He has meaning at that big Bible level. The Bible tells the story of creation, fall, redemption. It all hangs together. There's meaning at that level. Um, when we spend a lot of time on individual words, we can fall into the trap of making them mean more than God actually meant by them, more than Paul meant by them. That's a trap. And when we do that, we are liable to be importing inappropriate theological meaning. Here we get back to one of the improper uses of Greek. Um, if I had a dime for every time that a pastor mentioned the word agape in a sermon, I probably seriously would have um, some, some several hundred dollars. I've been around a while in evangelical preaching, and I've heard a lot of it. And if I had a dime for every time pastors used the word agape to say something the Bible wasn't actually saying, I would have only slightly less money. Just about every time I've heard pastors use the word agape, they end up importing theological meaning, which is, in my judgment, and I wrote a dissertation on this, inappropriate. They are taking their view of what love ought to be and claiming that the Greek word means this. And again, here we get back to the, the problem of using Greek in church. If you use Greek this way, you, Im you imply that people can't really see what the Bible means until they know Greek. That is not true. Everything people need to know about love, except for some tiny nuances, is visible to them in their good modern vernacular translation. They don't need to know the word agape. They don't need to, to know its contradistinction from the word phileo, a distinction which I'm not sure is really observable in very many, if any, contexts in the New Testament. Um, the, the, the linguistic fallacies that go with our teaching in the evangelical church about the word agape are rife. And I just have to point you to my dissertation and some other blog posts I've written on them for more. Um, a philosophy of words <clears throat> is going to not only get you to speak about word meaning accurately, but get you to speak about word meaning in an appropriately, appropriately limited way. You're not going to claim more for a word than it actually delivers to its context. And you're going to let context um, have its appropriate uh, place, its, its role. And it is 6.59 a.m., and I'm going to go just slightly over time with this last thing because I raised this question, who edits the dictionary? And the answer is, if you look at the American Heritage Dictionary or other dictionaries, contemporary dictionaries, they will commonly advertise a usage panel, a panel of educated people who will tell you what words mean. And that tells you something about our access to word meaning. Namely, that when you look in a dictionary, you're not looking at what words mean in a vacuum. You're looking at what educated elite speakers of the language and writers of the language mean when they use those words. And that is what you want to know. You want to know if I'm in educated circles, what will they mean by elemosinary? I don't want to make a mistake. I don't want to appear as if I don't belong. And that's a good Christian motivation, or at least it can be. You don't want to be loving greetings in the marketplaces, what you want to be loving is the, the ability to communicate to every person. You want to be able to stand before kings and not make them cringe at your language. A philosophy of language, we could just go on and on and on. 
And when we get into exegetical fallacies, we will talk more. I've written so much about this on my blog by faithwindersand.com. And I'm going to real quick add, while uh, Joel wraps us up here, I'm going to add a link to um, the category on my blog, which is focusing on linguistics. But Joel, you can take it away from here. Excellent. Thank you. Please do. Um, having your, your link on here would be great. Um, Mark, if it would be profitable as well, maybe you can put on here a link to your category within Logos. Uh, Mark is one of, he works for Logos, which is one of the Bible software companies, and he regularly puts up really high quality content there. So I would highly recommend that as well. Take a peek um, and look at some of his content there and continue, just continue to benefit from his writing. There's some great thoughts you'll continue to, to build on some of the things that he's talked about here and benefit from what he's done. Um, okay, before we go here, I just have to show you because I promised I would and it's important that what we've got coming up here for our next lecture, as I said, would be with Dr. Collins. And within Dr. Collins' lecture then, what you are expected to do and what we critically need to make sure we do is to be prepared with, um, excuse me, wrong window here to make sure you're prepared with an assignment on the discussion the the exegetical assignments he's given you so he's going to give us two things here you are going to be asked to do an interpretation of Ruth 2 and also an interpretation of Psalm 1 Ruth 2 and Psalm 1 okay what we're asking for is a three to four paragraph exegetical survey of each so take a look at this on the Moodle page and be sure pre-class exegesis of Ruth chapter 2 and then a pre-class pre -class exegesis of Psalm 1. Be sure to fulfill that assignment before the class because what the content of the class will be is working through these assignments. We'll spend our hour that way, okay, or the two hours that way. So if you have not fulfilled these assignments before the next class, when you come in, it will just be significantly less fit to you. Make sure you do these before you come. And then what Dr. Collins will do in the class, we will discuss both of these passages, Ruth chapter two, Psalm one, and he will give you some input on how to shape your interpretation. It's gonna be a very practical class and really help you work with these passages and understand what, how, how to proceed with poetry and with narrative. Okay, so he's giving these as two examples. Please, please, please make sure you take a look at this assignment on the Moodle page. You'll also see here is from our lecture today, I've put up a post class quiz. So you can take a quiz on today's lecture. It's there right now, it's live. As soon as you finish, if you wanna review, that's your information. Dr. Ward will be also putting up the notes or I'll be putting up those notes. So you'll see those um, hopefully within the day or so forth. And oh, I see it here. So I'll grab these notes, put them up there on the Moodle page. And um, if you have any questions, please just interact, send a message over. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Ward. And we'll look forward to seeing you again in a couple of weeks. I think your next lecture coming up in uh, two weeks, if I remember correctly. So these have been great. Really appreciate your work and, and the things that you've shared with us today. Praise the Lord. God bless you all. Okay. Thank you. Good, uh, good day to all. Have a great day. And we'll see you back again on Thursday.